Nearly all of the music heard in titles developed by Supergiant Games is written by one man, Darren Korb. For each new game, Korb reinvents his sound according to the setting. First there was a mystical western frontier, then a futuristic utopia gone wrong, and then a fantastical purgatory. So when Supergiant Games announced that their fourth title would take place in the underworld of ancient Greek mythology, it was clear we were going to hear a sound from Korb we'd never heard before. I just didn't think that sound was going to be progressive rock. Ah yes, the classic sick riffs of Eon's past. Korb has stated that he wouldn't have been able to forgive himself if he didn't include strong metal influences in a game about hell. It's not a perfect reference, since I'm pretty sure metal is only associated with the Christian interpretation of hell, but it sounds great, so who's complaining? And the genre is the least confusing thing about the Hades soundtrack. Hades is a game about escaping a twisting labyrinth that changes shape every time you fail and have to start over. And the soundtrack is just as confounding as the levels it accompanies. Like the flow of gameplay, there are many random elements that determine the course of the soundtrack in any given escape attempt. Most of the zones in the game have three or four region-specific tracks that can play, but you'll probably only hear two. Each of those tracks has up to seven different versions of itself, but you may hear as few as three. You'll typically keep hearing a track until it climaxes at its most intense form, but it might just stop. The different versions of a track more or less fall into three stages of play. We could call them one, two, and three, but I'm gonna go with chillin', groovin', and jammin', technical terms. Not even this is a hard and fast rule, though. Sometimes you might only hear a track in its chillin' and jammin' stages. I already regret this. The chillin' stage is fairly ambient. We only hear a few instruments at a time. To show how the different versions of a track relate to each other, we'll focus on just one track from this point on, and that track will be Out of Tartarus, because I like it. During battles in the chillin' stage, there's just some percussion and a bit of synth. Sometimes not even the synth. Between battles, part of that fades out. After a couple chambers with the chillin' stage, the track usually moves into the groovin' stage, and the melody comes in. If you're lucky, you get some guitar action too. And now between battles, instead of stripping the piece down to percussion or synth, everything fades out but the bass guitar. Or sometimes it just fades out to nothing at all, even if the same track picks up in the next room. I didn't notice it until I was grabbing footage for this video, but the transitions here aren't always simple crossfades from one version into another. There's a point where the track fades from just the bass into the full version with the lead guitar, but the guitar doesn't fade in with the rest of the instruments. If it did, it would sound kind of odd melting in mid-phrase because it's such a bright and dominant sound. The rest of the instruments faded in when I changed rooms. but the guitar didn't start until the next measure, when it could have a clean entry. Such a cool, subtle touch. The reason for all this randomness is the same for the music as it is for the gameplay. Hades is built around the concept of starting over when you fail. We all learned from retro arcade games that if you keep dying on level 5, you're gonna get real tired of levels 1 through 4. The evolving labyrinth is a common theme in modern games with the die and restart conceit because it takes the monotony out while leaving the repetition in. The same philosophy can be applied to the soundtrack, which would also get stale if there were only a couple static tracks for each zone. Close enough. This doesn't just keep the game from getting boring, it also keeps the danger alive. Putting familiar elements in unfamiliar combinations is the only way to let the player develop skills in the game without letting them get comfortable. Even the soundtrack has a hand to play in that. The jammin' stage is special in a number of ways. It consists of only one version of the track, its most intense form, and it only plays during mini-bosses and zone bosses. It also doesn't fade in and out like all the other versions of the track. That's not nearly enough of a statement. There are two things that can cue the jammin' stage. One is entering a room with a strong enemy that doesn't speak, and the other is finishing a conversation with a strong enemy that does speak. Either way, when the cue hits, the track fades from whatever version is playing to the fullest version of the groovin stage, with the lead guitar and all. Then it waits for the current measure to end and launches into a segue that brings the track into the opening phrase of the jammin stage, no matter what part of the track was playing before. 
The programming for this is much more involved than a fade because the game has to know where to insert the segue in time with the music. The player can feel the deliberate shift of the music directly responding to what's happening on screen. Like how amazing is this? And it's not just the beginning of this last stage that shapes the track around the gameplay. When you survive a tough fight, the music congratulates you for it. To show how elaborate this is, if you finish the fight at awkward timing, and it takes a while for the game to find a place to insert the ending, the outro is shortened to compensate. Every combat track in the game ends like this if it plays during a boss fight. So we've listened to this track out of Tartarus quite a bit now. Have you noticed anything strange about it? Try tapping your foot to it. In addition to the scrambled arrangements, the music itself is written in a confusing way by taking advantage of the prog rock genre, which is known for obscure and changing time signatures. Time signatures determine how beats group together to form coherent measures and phrases. Most songs, no, like most songs, are written entirely in 4-4, four, four, which means there are four quarter notes in a measure. See if you can hear the four beats and get a feeling for why the measure bars are where they are. Four is nice because it's really easy to dance to. Every measure has an even number of beats that come at a manageable speed, so pretty much any repetitive motion can be used as a dance move. And for this purpose I'm including head bobbing and toe tapping as dance moves. Most of the tracks in Hades have weird time signatures, but we're going to keep looking at Out of Tartarus because it's my favorite. It sounds like it's in 4-4 at first, but it gets interrupted. Oh god, what happened? Okay, let's figure this out. There is a repeating rhythm here, so let's pin that down first. This rhythm is fairly long, and it's exactly the same twice in a row, so we can pretty confidently put a measure bar right in the middle here. There might be more, but this is a good starting point. So now all we have to do is count the beats in this section to find out what time signature it is. This is a quarter note, or one beat in most cases, and it's twice as long as an eighth note. Math. We have mostly eighth notes here, so let's count out the measure in terms of how many eighth notes can fit in it. Two, four, five, six, seven, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, 19, 21. 21 eighth notes. 21! All right. You math whizzes out there will notice that 21 over 8 is not a fraction that can be simplified. That means that this is the smallest single time signature this phrase can be written in. No problem, right? I'm sure Darren Korb just counted to 21 really fast over and over as he recorded this piece. No. Fortunately, music notation allows for time signatures to change in the middle of the piece. So this can be broken down into a repeating cycle of smaller time signatures. They're still really bizarre, and this part is a little arbitrary. Like, that can be a measure. Drop a line there, that's 9-8. A pair of triplets can be written as 6-8. And this at the end could be taken at face value as three quarter notes. All right, you math whizzes out there will notice that 6-8 and 3-4 are the same thing. So why isn't it just two measures of 3-4? Well, it can be. Like I said, this part is arbitrary, but 6-8 is often counted in two. Versus 3-4, which is counted in three. It just has to do with where the emphasis lands, but they take up exactly the same amount of time. Hey, you want to see something funny? Hand this to a musician and ask them to sight read it. A few phrases in, Korb expects we've grown accustomed to the madness, and we need a reminder that we aren't allowed to know what's happening in this piece, so he subs out the final measure of the phrase for another 9-8, followed by one measure of 4-4, and he throws gaps of silence into the mix to keep the listener hanging. Don't worry, I'm not going to break that down, you can just trust me on it or count it for yourself. But this is how it sounds.
Now here is where the piece goes from unusual to clever. Try tapping your foot now. The riff rises in pitch and intensity, and a synth chorus comes in underneath. We switch to unbroken, uncomplicated 4-4, and the crash cymbal starts slamming out single beats. When this piece hits its stride, its goal isn't to confuse the listener anymore. When the piece shifts here in a way that makes you really want to move, it lets you. For the most part. Just keeping you on your toes. For a few phrases, the guitar just plays single beats through the whole thing. The storm has ended. And then the piece cycles back to the top and keeps going till you beat the bad guy. I don't know if this is intentional or not, but the fights don't tend to be long enough to loop back to the beginning, which means that as you approach victory, the rhythm turns more and more in your favor. Hades is a game about rebelling against fate and literally defying gods. The trials are intense, but overcoming them makes you feel like a certified badass. Having a soundtrack that both keeps you off balance and acknowledges your victories is a really effective tool for keeping both of these conflicting elements center stage. It just means it's not a particularly good ad for your running mix. If you want to see more video game soundtrack analyses like this one, consider subscribing to help me push for monetization so I can keep paying for Adobe's outrageously priced software. Thanks and see you next time.